Hi and welcome to our new YouTube tutorial. In this video we're going to talk about one of the newest and actually one of the hottest CSS layout modules called CSS Grid. Recently we made a video about another CSS layout module which was CSS Flexbox. You can find the link in the description and now it's the turn of CSS Grid. CSS Flexbox allows us to create the layout in a simpler and flexible way without using floats or any other older hacks. In the same way the CSS grid allows us to create the layout without floats, but sometimes it's more powerful than CSS Flexbox. Nowadays it's getting more and more popular because it gives us more flexibility and control of layout than ever before. Today we hear some questions about which layout module is better which one to use, but actually I think that both of them are really powerful. We can use both of them, CSS Flexbox and CSS Grid work together perfectly. One of the main differences between the CSS Flexbox and CSS Grid is that CSS Flexbox is a one-dimensional layout module, as for the CSS Grid, it's the two-dimensional layout. So what does this mean? You might know that Flexbox allows us to align items as a row or a column, and not as both of them. In case of the grid layout, it gives us the ability to divide the web page into rows and columns simultaneously. So you can find here the difference between the one-dimensional and two-dimensional layouts clearly. In the case of CSS Flexbox, we have a flex container with flex items, and in the same way, in the case of the CSS grid, we have a grid container and in order to make an element a grid container, you need to set its display property to grid or grid inline. The difference between the grid and grid inline values is almost similar to the difference between the flex and inline flex values. Actually, setting the display property to the grid is not enough to create a grid layout. We need to use other different properties as well. But before we go through them, I want to introduce you to some basic terminology about CSS Grid. So we have here a grid container and the items. The items inside the container are called grid items. As for the directions, we have a row axis as the horizontal direction and the column axis as the vertical direction. In Flexbox, we are able to change the horizontal and vertical directions, but in the case of the grid, we are not able to change the directions of row and column axis. The next important term that I want to refer to is grid lines. Actually, they are vertical and horizontal lines that divide the grid and separate the rows and columns. Remember that the number of grid lines is always greater by 1 to the number of the columns or rows. So, for example, if we have 3 columns, then the number of the lines will be 4, and the same for rows. According to the grid lines, we are able to move grid items to different positions. Besides that, we can create space between the grid items horizontally and vertically, and this space is called a grid gutter. Actually, grid gutter is a gap between rows and columns. So we may have a grid column gap and a grid row gap. Grid items with grid gaps are called grid track, in case of a horizontal grid track, we have a row, and the vertical grid track is called a column. Actually, right now this terminology might be confusing for you, because there is a lot to remember, but you don't have to worry, because throughout this tutorial you will get a huge practice in CSS Grid, and all of those terms will be clear for you. Alright, let's go ahead. So the single unit of a CSS Grid is called Grid Cell and any area of the grid surrounded by four grid lines is called grid area. Actually, it can contain many grid cells. Ok, so this was all about the basic CSS grid terminology, and now I want to show you the properties that we use with grid container and grid items. As you see, there are lots of them, so I'm not going to go through each of them right now, but those are the properties that we will play around with in the tutorial. Alright, so now it's time to start to create our first grid, but before that, at first I'm going to set up our working environment. I have created a new folder on the desktop called CSS Grid, in which I have a single HTML file. Let's go ahead and open this folder in VS Code, 
So as you can see right now the index.html file is empty. I'm going to create the basic HTML document. For that let's use Emmet. We need to place here an exclamation mark and then press the tab or enter. So here we go. Let's go ahead and change the title. I'm going to put here CSS grid. Alright, before I run this file in the browser I want to note that instead of Google Chrome we will use a different browser in this tutorial. It is Mozilla Firefox. I'm going to use it because this browser has the best developer tools for the CSS grid. It will allow us to explain how CSS grid works in a much better and simpler way. Actually Mozilla Firefox is not good for only the CSS grid but it also is one of the best browsers for developers and not only for developers. I think you may have already installed it but if not let's go ahead and get it. Let's type here Mozilla Firefox. Then go to the first link. So here we have a website called mozilla.org. In order to get this browser you need to click download now and then install it. I have already installed this browser. It is a very simple process so I'm not going to go through it. Alright, once we are done with installing Mozilla Firefox I'm going to launch our HTML file with a live server. It is a great VS Code package. The live server allows us to run the project live to the browser and make updates without refreshing the page each time. So I recommend to install and use this package. As you see the project has opened in Mozilla Firefox by default because I have set the default browser to Mozilla. You can either change the default browser or you can run the file in Google Chrome then grab the URL and run it to the Mozilla Firefox. Alright, I hope you have already run the file in Mozilla Firefox. Let's place the VS Code and the browser side by side and get started. The first thing that I want to do is to create the markup in HTML. Let's create div element with a class container. It will be the container of the items. So overall we will have six items. Let's open another div element and assign to it classes item and item1. Also let's insert here the text item1. Then I'm going to duplicate it five times and we need to change the class names and also the numbers of the items. We need items from two through 6. Alright, let's go ahead and give some stars to the container and to the each item. I'm going to use internal CSS. So let's open style tags in the head element. Then select container. At first I'm going to define its width. Let's make it 800 pixels. As the background color I'm going to use light gray color. So let's use DDD. Also create some space at the top and bottom and place the container in the center of the page. For that we need margin 40 pixels on top and bottom and then overall on left and right sides. Alright, so regarding the container we are done. Next I want to give some styles to the items. I mean I want to add some common styles to each of them. Therefore let's select the item which is a common class name. First of all I want to make some space on all four sides using padding. Let's make it 30 pixels. Then increase the font size. Make it 30 pixels as well. And change the color. Make it white. Alright, after that I want to assign to each individual item different background color. So let's go ahead and select the first one. I'm going to set its background color to FF4500. Let's duplicate this code five times and then quickly change the background colors. 
the second one is going to be 6 B 8 E 2 3 then we will have 4 1 6 9 E 1 then D 8 7 0 9 3 Next one is going to be DAA520. And for the last item, I'm going to use 8A2BE2. Alright, so with markup, we are done. Actually, right now, everything is ready to start to create CSS grid. For that, we need to assign to the container display grid. So, as you can see, right now nothing is changed because just display grid is not quite enough. We need to define rows and the columns. Suppose that we want to have two rows. Then, in order to do that, we need to use a property called grid template rows. Actually, we are able to assign to this property different types of values. But for now, let's start with pixels. As we said, we need to create two rows and suppose that we want each of them to be equal to 150 pixels. So for that we have to write 150 pixels, then space, and again 150 pixels. So as you see, the first two items got a height of 150 pixels. In the same way, let's define the columns. As you already guessed, for that we need to use a property called grid template columns. Suppose that we want to have three columns with the same size, I mean 150 pixels, so we need to insert it three times. Let's save and here we go. We have here our very first grid. It consists of two rows and three columns. In this case, items have the shape of the square because we used here 150 pixels everywhere. Alright, in order to see better how this grid looks like, I'm going to inspect the page. So here we have developer tools. Actually, it's kind of similar to Google Chrome's developer tools. On the left side, we have an HTML document. Let's click the container. So as you see, on the right side, we see the styles of the container. We have here a display grid and in front of the grid there is a special grid icon. If we click on that, then the boxes will be surrounded by the lines. Actually, the outer lines are kind of solid and between the boxes we have dashed lines. On the left side, in the developer tools, we have the layout section. You see here overlay grid and some grid display settings. Checkbox which is placed with div container is already checked. That's because we have clicked the grid icon here. So actually, they are the same. You can either check here this box or click on the grid icon here. Down below, we have our grid scheme. So if we hover over that, then the proper box will be highlighted on the page. Besides that, we can display the line numbers. And for that, we just need to check the first checkbox. Actually, this is the great feature of Mozilla Firefox regarding the CSS grid. Right now it's not applied to Google Chrome and that's the main reason why we are using Mozilla Firefox throughout this tutorial. Alright, so that's the way how we can create rows and columns. For that we used those two properties, I mean grid template rows and grid template columns. Next that I want to show you is how to create the space between the rows and the columns. As you remember it was called grid gutter or grid gap. So in order to create grid gap, let's say between the rows, we need to use a property called row gap. Actually, recently we were using grid row gap. It still works, but you can already use row gap. Let's say we want the space between the rows to be equal to 30 pixels. So you see that we've got here the space between the first and the second rows. In the exact same way, we can create the gap between the columns as well. For that, we have to use the property called column gap. Let's make the space equal to 50 pixels. So you see that we have space between the columns and it equals to 50 pixels. In this case, we have defined gaps separately for rows and columns. 
but we are able to use a shorter way and with just a single line of code we can define gaps for rows and for columns as well. In order to do that we have to use a property called gap. Recently we were using a property called grid gap, but now you can use just gap. As the first value we need to indicate the row gap. Let's make it 30 pixels. And as the second one we need to write the value of the column gap property. 50 pixels. Let's comment those lines out. So if we save, then nothing will change. In this case we use different values, but if you want the gap to be let's say 30 pixels for rows and for columns as well, then you don't have to write it twice, you just need to leave here 30 pixels and it will work fine. Alright, so once we are familiar with a couple of basic things about CSS grid, it's time to move on and discuss different types of values which you can use with grid template rows and grid template columns. So in this case we have a grid that consists of two rows and three columns and as you can see in the container there is an extra available space. So what can we do if we want to take up the full width which is available in the container? Suppose we want to expand the third column all the way to the end of the container then for that, instead of 150 pixels, we can use auto. So you see that the item 3 and item 6 are stretched all the way to the end of the container. If we do the same for the second column, I mean if we write here auto, then those two columns, I mean the second and the third columns, will take up the available space inside of the container equally. So this is one way how the grid items take up the full width in the container, but there is also another way which is more flexible and convenient. Instead of pixels or auto values, we can use a special measurement unit which is created for the CSS grid and it is called a fractional unit. So if we change auto into 1FR, actually FR stands for the fractional unit, then we will get the same result. So again, FR is a special unit defined for the CSS grid and it helps us to divide space into a fraction of the available space. Let's get rid of 150 pixels and insert here 1 FR. So in this case all three columns take up even space in the container. We can manipulate the size of the columns using fractional units. Suppose that we want the second column to be twice bigger than the rest of the columns then we can change 1FR into 2FR. So you see that the size of the second column has increased and it is twice bigger than the first and the third columns. In order to prove that, let's check the width of the columns in pixels. So you see that the width of the first and third columns is 185 pixels and the width of the second column is 370 pixels. So as we said, it is twice wider than the first and third columns. Alright, let's change the value of the first column and write here 3FR instead of 1. So in this case, the second column is twice wider than the third one and the first column is three times wider than the third one. Alright, let's make all the columns equal to 1FR. So actually, that's the way how the fractional unit works. You can use that unit with rows as well. In this case we have rows equal to 150 pixels, so if we change the second one into 1FR then the size of the second row will decrease and actually happens because in this case the height of the container is not defined and the second row took up the height which is required to display the content of the row. In this case we have here padding equal to 30 pixels. If we get rid of it for a while then the height of the second row will decrease again. Alright, let's turn on the padding back and then define the height of the container. I'm going to make it 450 pixels. So you can see that the second row takes up the full height that is available inside of the container. So the fractional unit works in the exact same way with rows. If we change 150 pixels into 1FR, then both rows will take up even space. And if we change the value of the first row into 2FR, then it will become twice higher than the second one. 
All right. As you see here, we used one fr three times for the columns. Instead of that, we can use repeat function, which in general takes two arguments. The first one is going to be the number of the columns. We have here three columns. Each of them is equal to one fr. So as the first argument, we need to insert here three, then comma, and we have to pass here the second argument, one fr. So as you can see, we have here the same result. Using the repeat function, we can avoid writing the same values over and over again. It is a more convenient and kind of shorter way. Besides that, we are able to use other different measurement units. In this case, I'm going to use percentage. Suppose that we want the first column to be 50% and the rest of two columns to be 1FR. For that, we need to change 3 into 2. So in this case, the first column takes up 50% of the container. If we check the width of it, then we will get 400 pixels, which is exactly the half of the entire width of the container. And the second and third columns take up the rest of the available space. So that's the way how the percentage values work. Besides that, we can use all kinds of measurement units. Let's test the viewport width. In this case, the width of the first column is equal to half of the entire viewport, and the second and third columns take up the rest of the available space. All right, that's it about the measurement units. Now I'm going to talk about positioning and spanning the grid items. So the grid allows us to position elements without using floats or without even changing the HTML, and we can do it in a very simple way. Let's go ahead and make some slight changes here in the code. Let's get rid of 50 viewport width. Also change 2 into 3 in the repeat function. And also make the first row 1FR. Suppose that we want to place the item 1 on item 6th place. In order to do that, we have to use the grid line numbers. And also, in order to move the grid item, we need to use several properties. The first one is going to be the grid column start which we need to assign to the proper item, in this case item 1. This property is used for line-based placement of grid items along the column's start line. So in other words, it allows us to specify on which line the grid item starts. In this case, I want it to start on column line 3 and end on column line 4. So we need to indicate this position as well. And for that, we need to use a property called grid column end. Let's make it 4. So in this case, item 1 is placed in the third column, but actually it's not the correct position because we wanted it to be placed on sixth item's position. Also, as you see, positions of other items are kind of messed up. And besides that, you can see a new row added to our grid. Actually, it is an implicit row and it's done automatically when the available space is not enough in the grid. Actually, this behavior will be discussed later in detail. So the next step is to define the proper position according to the row line numbers. So as you guessed, we have to use the property called grid row start. In this case, we need to start it on line number 2. And then let's use grid row end with the line number 3. So you see that the item 1 is positioned on item 6th place and all the other items have changed their positions. It happens because we have not defined their positions manually and they have moved according to the grid auto placement algorithm. All right, so that's the way how we can change the position of the grid items. Actually, we have used here four different properties and you may think that it seems to be a kind of long way and actually it is. So we are able to use here shorter way we can define grid column start and grid column end simultaneously. And the same we can do with grid row start and grid row end. So let's leave those properties as they are and then move on to the item 2. I want to place item 2 on item 6 place. So let's go ahead and assign to the item 2 property called grid column. As the first value, we need to indicate the grid column start. In this case, it's column line number 2. Then, in order to separate the values, we need to put forward slash. And as the second value, we need to specify the line number of the grid row end, which is 3. 
So as you see, instead of two properties, we use just the grid column. And in the exact same way, we have to define the row line numbers. And for that, we have to use a property called grid row. So as the starting line number, we need to specify two. And as the ending point, we need to write three. So you see that the item two is positioned where we want it to be placed. So this is a shorter way, but we can do the same in an even shorter way, just with a line of code. For that, we have to use a property called grid area. Then as the first value, we need to specify the starting column line, two. Next, we need to indicate the starting row line number, which is two again. Then we should have an ending column line number, three. And lastly, we need an ending row line number, three. Let's comment those lines out. So you see that nothing is changed. We have the same results, and actually it is the shortest way that we can use to position grid items. I think that it is a kind of confusing way, so I personally prefer to use the previous approach. Alright, besides moving the grid items from one position to another, we are able to span them, I mean to increase the length of the item by occupying two or more cells. Suppose that we want to stretch item 3 from line 1 to line 3. For that, we need to indicate its position in the following way. Let's use grid column. So it starts from the line 1, and I want it to end on line 3. So you see that the item 3 is stretched from line 1 to line 3, and it is occupying two cells. In the same way, we are able to stretch it vertically. Suppose that we want item 3 to occupy the first and second rows. For that, we have to write grid row with the line numbers 1, and 3. So you see that the item 3 is stretched vertically as well. Some of the items have changed their positions except item 1 and item 2. Item 1 has maintained its position, as for the item 2 it is placed behind the item 3. So the reason is that we defined the positions for item 1 and item 2 manually. In order to display item 2 we can use CSS property called zindex. As you know, if you want to apply this property to an element, then it should have any of the positions except static. But in case of the grid, we don't have to do that, because when the element becomes a grid item, then we can use the index without defining the position. So if we assign to the item 2 the index with the value, let's say, 10, then item 2 will appear. Okay, suppose that we want to stretch the item 3 horizontally all the way to the end of the container. Then in order to do that, as you already guessed, we just need to change the line number 3 into 4. So now it takes up the entire row, but for that we have an even better solution. In general, when you want to stretch the item to the end of the container, instead of the specific line numbers, we can use minus 1. So you see, nothing changed. Item 3 is still stretched to the end of the container. Alright, let's go ahead and try to do the same vertically. Let's insert minus 1 as the second line number. Now nothing is changed. It seems that it doesn't work for rows, but it's not correct. In this particular case, as you remember, the third row is automatically added. We didn't create it initially, and that's why it wasn't recognized. Make sense? Alright, besides that, we are able to use spanning with grid items in a different way. Let's comment positions for item 3 out. Then suppose that we want to stretch the item 6 to the end of the container. In order to achieve that, as you already know, we can use line numbers 1 and 4 or minus 1. But also there is another way. Let's insert here 1, then use keyword span. And now we need to indicate how much we want the grid item to span. So as we said, we want to stretch the item 6 all the way to the end of the container. So we need to count line numbers starting from here, I mean starting from where the item 6 ends. So 1, 2, 3, we need to write here 3. And if we save, then we will get needed result. If we change 3 into 2, then the item 6 will occupy 2 cells from line 1 to line 3. Alright, so that's the way how we can position and span grid items inside the container.
Next, I'm going to show you how to name the grid lines and grid areas using different methods. So we are able to name the grid lines and then use those names instead of the grid line numbers. In order to do that, we are going to use kind of a different example. We'll build a simple page layout. Before we start, let's have a quick look at the finished version. So this is a simple page layout template. So I'm going to comment everything out and we will start from scratch. Let's go ahead and first of all create the HTML markup. I'm going to create a div element which is going to be the container. Actually the container will consist of six different elements. The first one will be header with text header. Then the next one is going to be the sidebar. So let's open again div element with the class sidebar. As the content, let's insert here sidebar. The next one is going to be the main content. After the main content, we will have three little boxes. So let's open another div element with the class box1 and insert here text box1. Then duplicate it twice and change the class names and the text as well. We need box2 and box3. And the last element that I'm going to insert here is the footer. So let's open development with the class footer. All right, so the markup is ready. Let's go ahead and give some styles to those elements. At first, I'm going to select the container. Let's define width and height. I'm going to set its width to 800 pixels. As for the height, let's make it 500 pixels. Then I'm going to change the background color Let's use here color EF, EF, EF. And finally, to place the container in the center of the page, let's use margin auto. All right, so here is our container and now it's time to make it a grid container. For that, as you already know, we have to set the display property to a grid. Then after that, we have to define rows and columns. So let's use grid template rows. Actually, we need to have five rows in our container. All of them will take up one fractional unit. So we can simply use your repeat function with arguments 5 and 1fr. But in order to explain better how to name the grid lines and the grid areas, let's use here 1fr five times. In the same way, we need to have four columns. So let's define grid template columns and assign to it 1fr four times. And the last thing that I want to do with the container is to create some space between the items. So let's use gap and make it one rem. All right, so with the container we are done. Let's move on and create some common styles for the grid items. Let's select all div elements from the container so we need container and the div. At first, let's change the background color. I'm going to use here royal blue. Then change the font size, make it 1.5 rem. Place the text in the center using text align center. Then I'm going to create some space inside of the element using padding. Let's set it to 1 rem on all four sides. And finally, change the color, make it white. Alright, so with markup and with some common CSS styles, we are done. Let's go ahead and align the elements. I'm going to start with the header. So let's select this element and define its position in the following way. Let's use here property called grid column. We need to stretch the header from column 1 to column 5. It should take up the entire row. So as the starting column number, we need 1. As for the ending column number, you can write either 5 or minus 1. Because as we said, the header should take up the entire row. Let's use here minus 1. So as you see, the header is extended all the way to the end of the first row. 
Let's take care of the grid row. So the header should take up the first row, therefore we need here 1 and 2. Okay, so the header is positioned. Next, let's do the same for the sidebar. Let's take a look at the finished version. So the sidebar is positioned like so. I'm going to copy those two properties, paste them here and change the line numbers accordingly. So the starting column line number will be 1. As for the ending line number, it should be 2. Because the sidebar should be placed in the first column. Next, we have to change the line numbers for the grid row. The sidebar will start at row line number 2. And as an ending line number, we need to insert here 5. Alright, so as you can see, with the sidebar we are done. Let's go ahead and position the main content. Let's select main and paste the grid column and grid row properties. So the starting column line number for the main element should be 2 and it will be extended all the way to the end of the container so the ending column line number will be minus 1. As for the grid row, like sidebar, we need here starting row line number 2. Main content will take up 2 rows so as an ending row line number we need 4. Alright, so the main content is positioned in the right way and also those three little boxes are placed where we wanted them to be placed. But despite this, I want to define their positions as well. So let's select box 1 and define grid column and grid row. We need 2 and 3. As for the grid row, we need here 4 and 5. Let's duplicate this code twice, then change the class names and the line numbers. For the second box, we need grid column 3 and 4. As for the third box, we need grid column 4 and minus 1. Alright, so the boxes are ready and the last element that we want to position is a footer. Like the header, it should be extended all the way to the end of the last row. So let's select this element and define grid column as 1 minus 1. And the grid row, we need here 5 minus 1. Alright, so that's it. We have just built our simple page layout. In this case, to position the elements, we used grid line numbers. Actually, it's the first method, and for me, it's the best and the most flexible one. But as we said, we can align grid items in different ways. Next, I'm going to show you how we can align the grid items by defining some names. Let's go ahead and at first define the names for the rows. Actually, here we have one fractional unit five times. The first one belongs to the header, so we need to define the names in the following way. We need to open square brackets. And now we can choose the proper name for the starting point of the header. Let's say header start. Then after the first value, we need to indicate the ending of the header. So write header end. Actually, where the header ends, the main content starts. So besides the header end, we can put here main start. It means that we can use more than one name at the same time. So, as you see, the main content takes up two rows, so after the third value, we need to insert main end. Alright, so where the main content ends, the boxes start, so with the main end, we can also write box start. Then, as you guessed, after the fourth value, we need to insert box end. So, where the boxes end, the footer starts, so let's insert here footer start. And lastly, after the last fractional unit, we need to put footer end. Alright, so we have defined the names for starting and ending points of our elements, and now let's go ahead and see how we can use those names. For the header, we have already defined here column and row line numbers, and so here we can change the values of the grid row property to the names which we have just defined.
Instead of 1, which indicates the starting line number of the header, we can write header start. And then instead of 2, which is the ending line number, we can write header end. So if we save, then nothing will change because those values work in the exact same way as the line numbers do. Alright, the next element here is the sidebar. It starts from the second row and ends at line number 5. So here instead of 2, we can write either header end or main start. Both values will do the same job. So I'm going to choose main start. As for the ending point, we have here two names, box end and footer start. So let's choose box end. So you see that the position of the sidebar is not changed because those values work fine. Okay, next we have the main content and in case of main content we can simply use main start and main end. Next we have three little boxes. We define the names for them. So let's change the line numbers with the multi cursor. We need box start and box end. And finally we have here the footer. So let's insert footer start and footer end. Alright, so you see that nothing is changed because we have just defined the row line numbers in a different way. Before we move on, I want to give you little advice regarding naming the grid items. In our case, we defined names for the main content and for the boxes, but we didn't do that for the sidebar. The reason is that sidebar, main and box elements are placed at the same level. If we define names for only the sidebar, then we could not use those names for the main content and those three boxes. So if you have the same situation in the future, always try to define the names for smaller items in order to manage the positioning of other larger items. Of course we could define the names for the sidebar as well, but then there would be many names and much typing and it would become a little bit messy. So I recommend to define the names as we did it here. Ok, so we defined the names for the row lines, let's move on and do the same for columns. Actually, here we have one fr four times, so I'm going to change those values and use here repeat function, which will take two arguments. The first one is going to be the number of the columns, which is four, and then we need one fr. So you may wonder how we can define the names for the columns, and actually it is an interesting part. In this case, we need to define the starting column line and the ending column line. So we need to do it in the following way. Let's open the square brackets before 1fr and insert here call start. Then open again square brackets and write call end. So here we defined some general names for the column lines and now let me show how we can define the names for the individual column line numbers. So here we have column line number 1 and it is actually equivalent of call start 1. So we can put here call start 1. Suppose that we want to extend the header to only one column, I mean from line 1 to line 2. In this case we need to write call end 1 instead of 2. So as you can see the header takes up only the first column. Actually column line number 2 can be considered as call end 1 or call start 2. So if we change call end 1 into call start 2, then we will get the same result. If we want the header to take up the first two columns, then in the exact same way we can write call end 2 or call start 3. But I think it would be more accurate if we use call and two. Alright, so that's how the names work in case of the repeat function. Let's align the header in the right way. We need call and four. Or we can just use here call and minus one. Okay, let's go ahead and define the names for the rest of the elements. The next one is a sidebar. We need here call start one 
and call end one. The next element is main. As you see, it starts from column line number two. So we need to write call start two. It goes all the way to the end of the container. So let's insert call end minus one. Okay, let's go ahead and define the names for the boxes. For the first box, we need call start two and then call and two. For the second one, it's going to be call start three and then call and three. And for the third box, I'm going to insert here call start four and call and minus one. All right, for the last element, which is the footer, we need the same values that we used for the header. So I'm going to copy and paste it here. All right, so that's the way how we can define the names for the grid items. Now I'm going to talk about the naming of grid areas. Right now we no longer need the names for rows and columns. I mean the names which we have just defined because I think it will be a little bit confusing, so I'm going to delete them. Then let's use here repeat function and insert the arguments 5 and 1 fractional unit. Also we don't need the names for columns as well, so let's delete them. And besides that we have to remove grid column and grid row properties for our elements. So let's go ahead and quickly Get rid of them. Alright, so now I want to introduce you to a new grid container property which is called grid template areas. Using this property we're able to give a name to each cell inside our grid container. Actually those names should be placed within quotes and we need to do it in the following way. So let's open quotes. So, as you remember, header element was taking up the entire row and it was extended to all four columns. So, it should take up four grid cells and we need to insert here the names for those four cells. So, I'm going to insert here header four times. Then, as you remember, the sidebar was taking up three cells in the first column and also on the right side we had main content. It was taking up the rest of the space in the second and third rows. So on the second line we have to put sidebar and then main three times. So as a guest we are building here our entire page layout. The next line should be the same, so let's just duplicate it. After that we have one cell for the sidebar and the rest of the cells for the little boxes. So we need sidebar, then box 1, box 2, and box 3. And on the last line we should place the footer, so let's insert it four times. Alright, so actually the layout is ready and now we have to assign to each element the proper name. For that we have to use a new property called grid area. Let's start with the header, use grid area and assign to it just header. So if we save then the header will be placed in the right way. In the exact same way let's assign to the sidebar grid area with the value sidebar. Then we have the main content. After that we have three little boxes. So let's assign to the first one grid area with the value box 1. Then I'm going to copy it and paste it for the rest of the boxes. I'm going to change the names. We need box 2 and box 3. And lastly we have a footer. So let's insert here grid area with the value footer.
All right, so as you can see, we have here the exact same page layout. This method is really convenient, especially when you already know what kind of layout you will need for your web page. Okay, before we move on to the next topic, I want to show you a couple of things. If you miss here the name of any of the cells, let's say footer, then it won't work and your items will be messed up. So you definitely need to be careful and define the names for every cell inside the container. Besides that, if you want to make one cell empty inside the container for some reason, then instead of the name, you need to place here the dot. For example, if you use dot instead of the header, then the fourth cell will be empty. Alright, that's it about naming the grid areas. It was the third and the last method for aligning the grid items inside the container. Now it's time to move on and talk about implicit and explicit grids. In order to discuss what explicit and implicit grids are, let's use another example. I'm going to comment everything out. Then create the markup quickly. I'm going to open development, which will be the container. Then inside the container, I'm going to insert eight items. So open development with the class item and then insert here the text item one. So as we said, we're going to have eight items. Let's duplicate this line of code seven times and then quickly change the numbers of the items. We need numbers from 2 through 8. So the markup is ready. Let's go ahead and give those elements some styles. At first, let's select the container. I'm going to define its width. Let's make it 600 pixels. Then change the background color. I'm going to use EF, EF, EF. Then, in order to place the container in the center, let's use margin oral. And after that, I'm going to make the container grid container. So, let's use display grid. And also, define columns and rows. I'm going to create two columns each of them equal to 1FR, so we need grid template columns with repeat function and with the arguments 2 and 1FR. As for the rows, we're going to have two rows, each of them equal to 100 pixels. So let's use repeat function with the arguments 2 and 100 pixels. And finally, let's create space between the columns and the rows. Use gap with value 1 rem. All right, so with the container, we are done. Let's select the items using the class item. First of all, let's change the font size, make it 2 rem. Then define the background color. I'm going to make it royal blue. Change the color of the text, make it white. And finally, place the text in the center using text align center. All right, so here we have our grid container with its grid items. As you see on the page, we have different types of grid items. Four of them, which are placed in the first two rows, are larger than the rest of the items. And the reason for that difference is exactly what I want to talk about right now. The size of the first two rows is 100 pixels, and if we check it, you will see that it's definitely 100 pixels. For the rest of the rows, we did not define the size, and the grid items got a height that was needed to display the content of the item automatically. So the first part of this grid is called an explicit grid because it is explicitly defined. As for the second part, it's called an implicit grid because we didn't define the size of the rows manually. If you take a closer look at the page, you will notice that the explicit grid is surrounded by the solid line. It is hard to see here, but you will notice it on your screen.
Inside the explicit grid, rows are separated by the dashed lines. As for the implicit grid, you see that the rows are separated by dotted lines. So that's the way how Mozilla Firefox distinguishes explicit and implicit grids. Alright, you may wonder how we can manipulate the implicit grid. For that we have several properties in CSS. In order to change the height of the implicit rows, we can use property called grid auto rows. Let's assign to it 150 pixels. So you can see that the height of those two rows increased and now it became 150 pixels. Besides that, we are able to change the direction and transform the implicit rows into implicit columns. For that there is another property called grid auto flow. By default its value is set to row, but now let's change it and make it column. So as you can see, now our implicit rows became columns and the order of the grid items changed. We have item 1, then down below item 2, then item 3, item 4 and so on. After setting a grid auto flow property to a column, grid auto rows no longer work because as we said implicit rows now became implicit columns. Therefore we need to change the grid auto rows property into grid auto columns. Now if we check the width of them, you will see that it's 150 pixels. Ok, actually that's it about explicit and implicit grids. Would be better if you try to avoid using those things in the real world projects. But anyway, if you need to use them, then you already know how to deal with the explicit and the implicit grids. Alright, the next topic that we are going to discuss regarding the CSS grid is how to align the grid items and grid tracks. Before we start to write the code, I'm going to make here some changes. Let's delete those two properties, which we have used regarding the explicit and implicit grid. And then instead of two rows, let's create four of them. Ok, so the first property that I want to introduce you is called Justify Items. It allows us to align grid items horizontally inside the cells. By default this property is set to Stretch. So you see that in case of Stretch we have the same result. Besides that the Justify Items property can take three other values. The next one is Center. Actually, this value allows us to align items in the center horizontally inside of the cell. Besides that, we have also Start, which aligns items on the left side of the grid cell. And as you already guessed, we have also End. It places items on the right side at the end of the grid cell. Alright, so that's the way how Justify Items property works. Again, it allows us to align items horizontally. In order to align the items vertically, we need to use a property called align items. It works in a similar way as justify items does, but it moves the items in the vertical direction. Like justify items, this property is set to a stretch by default. So if we use this value, then nothing will change. In the case of the align items, we have the same values, I mean center, which allows us to place items in the center of the grid cell. In this case, grid items take up the height which is required to display the content. In the same way, we can use start. It will place the items at the top of the cell. And then we have end, which allows us to align the items at the bottom of the grid cell. Alright, so those two properties work for all grid items inside the container. But if you want to align an individual grid item, then you need to use different properties like justify self and align self. Before we use those properties, let's go ahead and assign the individual class to one of the items. Let's say to item 3. Then let's go ahead and select it. And use a property called justify self. So when you use those properties for individual items, then justify items and align items properties are overwritten and those individual properties are applied. Like justify items, justify self can take four values as well. If you want to stretch item horizontally inside the cell, then you need to use a value called stretch. Also, we can place the item on the left side using start. Then in the center using value center. And of course, on the right side using end. 
Alright, let's change the place for item 3 and align it on the left side. So use here value called start. Alright, so that's the way how justify self property works. Again, it allows us to align the individual items horizontally. Let's go ahead and see how we can move an individual item vertically. For that, as we already said, we can use a property called align self. I'm sure that you already guessed how it works. It can be used in the same way, like justify self. It can take similar values with slightly different names, but all those values will allow us to move the items vertically. So we have stretch, then center, then we can use flex end instead of just end, and flex start instead of start. All right. So before we move on to the next topic, I'm going to show you one more thing regarding justify self and align self properties. In this case, each grid item was moving inside one cell, but it would be interesting what happens if an item is spanning across the multiple cells. So let's assign to the item three grid row with the line numbers two and four, because I wanted to take up the second and the third rows and also define grid column with the line numbers 1 and minus 1 because I wanted to extend all the way to the end of the container. As you can see for item 3 nothing is changed because justify self and align self properties are set to the start. But if you change those values and use here center then the item 3 will be placed in the center of the entire area which we have just defined for it. All right. So we have considered how we can align the items inside the grid cell and the grid area and now I'm going to talk about how to align the grid track itself inside the container. It is actually really similar to CSS Flexbox. In order to align the grid track inside the container we need to use two properties justify content and align content. The first one allows us to move the grid track horizontally and the second one does the same but vertically. Okay. Let's go ahead and use those properties, but before that, again, I want to make here some changes. Let's delete styles for item 3. Also get rid of the class from that element. Then we don't need those two properties. And also I'm going to increase the width of the container to 800 pixels. Then define the height for the container, make it 600 pixels and lastly I'm going to set the width of each column to 150 pixels. Alright, so we are ready to go. Let's use at first justify content which as we said allows us to move the grid track horizontally. This property can take several values so let's go ahead and describe each of them. The first one is going to be start it allows us to place a grid track on the left side of the container. So as you can see, nothing is changed here because it's the default value. If we use the next value, which is the center, then the grid track will be placed in the center of the container. As you can see, in case of a justify content with the value center, the entire grid has moved to the center. Also, we can use end which will place the grid track on the right side at the end of the container. All right, as it was in case of Flexbox, we can use values like space between, which as you know, creates space between the grid tracks. Besides that, we have space around. It creates space on the left and right sides of the grid tracks. And also we can use space evenly, which creates even space between the grid tracks. Alright, so that's the way how justify content property works in the CSS grid. Again, it allows us to align the grid track horizontally. As for the vertical alignment, we can use the align content property. Actually, in Flexbox, this property acts in a kind of different way, so do not be confused regarding it. Align content property works similarly to justify content, but as we said, it moves the grid track vertically. So we have the following values. The first one is start which in this case doesn't have any effect because it's the default value. Then we have center, then end, 
And besides that, we can use space between, space around, and space evenly. All right, so with aligning grid items and grid tracks, we are done. Next, I'm going to talk about another topic, which is a kind of challenging one, but not too hard to understand. So I'm going to consider what max content, mean content and mean max function are. At first, let's make here slight changes, get rid of justify content and align content properties. And also we don't need the height for the container anymore. As you see, the columns are defined using repeat function and in order to explain better, let's create four columns, each of them equal to one fractional unit. So write it four times. As for the rows, let's define two of them with the height equal to 150 pixels. All right. Actually, we've been using values like pixels and fractional units so far. But besides that, we are able to use different types of values like max content, mean content and mean max function. Let's go ahead and start with the max content. As you see here, each column has even width because we used here one fractional unit for all the columns. But if we change here the first value into max content, then the width of the first column will decrease and it will take up the width that is required to display the content of the grid item. In order to see better what I mean, let's add to one of the grid items in the first column some additional content. So you see that the width of the entire column increased because when we use the max content value, then the grid items take up the width that is required to display the content of the largest grid item. So in the case of the max content, text inside the grid item is not wrapped. But in the case of the min content, it will happen. Let's change max content into min content. So you can see that now the text is wrapped and the grid item took up the width which is required to display the largest word in that text. In order to see it better, let's add some more letters to one of the words. So you see that the width of the column has increased. Alright, so actually it's the main difference between the max content and min content. Let's go ahead and move on to the min max function. As its name suggests, the minmax function allows us to define the range of the sizes of rows and columns. Let's see what I'm talking about. At first I'm going to change the value of the width. Let's make it 90%. Because I want to demonstrate how minmax function works when we shrink the browser. Now let's change the last value of the grid template columns property. Instead of 1fr, write minmax. As the first argument, we need to insert a minimum value of the range, let's say 150 pixels. As for the second argument, I'm going to use the maximum value, let's say 300 pixels. So here we say that the width of the fourth column should be at least 150 pixels and at most 300 pixels. So in this case, the width of the fourth column is 300 pixels because there is enough space if there is enough space, then the column or the row will always take up the maximum width, which is specified in the minmax function. As soon as there is not enough space, then the width of the column will start to decrease, and when it reaches the minimum value, which in this case is 150 pixels, then the column won't shrink anymore, and it will maintain that minimum width. Make sense? Okay, in order to prove that, let's make the browser smaller. As you see, when I start to shrink the browser, then at first three columns start to shrink and as soon as there is not enough space, the fourth column starts shrinking. Then when the width of it reaches to 150 pixels, it stops shrinking. Okay, so that's the way how minmax function works. It's very handy and convenient. Alright, so that's it about max content, min content and minmax function. Step by step, we are moving to the end of this tutorial. The last two things that I want to discuss are autofill and autofit values. Those values are great features of CSS Grid, so let's move on and talk about them. First of all, let's change back the width of the container to 
800 pixels. Also, I want to change the position of the container slightly. Let's set the margin on top and bottom to 40 pixels. Actually, we don't need grid template rows and grid gap properties at all. So let's comment them out. So what is autofill? Autofill fills the row with as many columns as it can fit. So when we use autofill, it creates implicit columns. Let's get rid of those values and use here repeat. As the first argument, I'm going to insert autofill and then use 80 pixels. So as you can see, now we have 10 columns, eight of them include the items and the last two columns are empty. Actually, the width of our container is 800 pixels. We define the width for each column as 80 pixels and we have eight items. But because of that, there was enough space on the page. Then two more columns were created additionally inside the container. So again, autofill allows us to fill the row with as many columns as it is possible. That's the way how autofill works. Now let's talk about autofit. Actually, when we use autofill, it fits currently available columns inside the container so that they take up the available space. So if we change autofill into autofit, then we won't have empty columns anymore, but still there will be 10 columns, the last two of them with zero width. The reason is that there are no more existing items in HTML. Autofit allows us to make the layout responsive if we assign to width property the relative measurement unit like percentage, let's say 90%, and then make the browser smaller. Then as soon as there is not enough space, items will start to wrap. Besides that, if you take a closer look, you will notice that the number of columns decreases because the width of the container decreases as well. All right, so that's it about autofill and autofit. And actually, we can say that we have finished talking about the CSS grid. Hopefully, this tutorial was interesting and helpful and you learned lots of things about CSS grid. So if you like this video, then please thumbs up, comment below, share it, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to get notified on coming tutorials. Okay, see you in the next video.